Hey everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast, where we cover the full spread of food and beverage industry topics. My name is Bianca, PR and marketing professional by day and food and wine connoisseur by night. And my name is Nick, an accountant with a passion for barbecue, beer, and whiskey. Today we welcome Sean and Nicole Miner of Sean Miner Wines. Sean is the founder and CEO of the winery and Nicole is the marketing director. In today's episode, Sean talks about the winery's roots in California and Oregon as a family business, their evolution from Four Bears to Sean Minor Wines, and we also get into some interesting food and wine pairing topics. If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us. With that said, let's welcome Sean and Nicole Miner. everyone. Today we are welcoming Nicole and Sean Miner to the podcast from Sean Miner Wines. Let's start by having you introduce yourselves to the audience and tell us a bit about the spark that led to the opening of your brand. All right. Well, you want me to answer that one? Um, sure. So um, I'm Sean Miner and Nicole and I started this in 2005. Um, I have actually been in the business since... Um, 1988, so a while, so 30 plus years working for a number of different wineries. Uh, worked for BB in Napa, um, went up to Oregon, ran King Estate Winery, then Benton Lane Winery. So we spent about eight vintages up in Oregon, came back down to California to run Renwood Winery out in the foothills, making some old vines in. And then we started this uh, in 2005 in Sonoma. So the wineries located just south of the Sonoma Square on 8th Street East, but we dabble in a number of different ABAs around the state, as well as we have a project up in uh, Oregon called Point North. So uh, I handle all the in, in uh, vineyard uh, background and relationships, and, and uh, Nicole handles all our marketing and social media. So we're a true family entity. We're a small company. We have about 10, 10 employees, and and uh, fortunately, uh, our wines are distributed pretty much around the country. So, in nice. six countries. Yeah. So, you built this together. Definitely have a family business. Bianca and I know a bit about what that's like. We're brother and sister. Um, what do you guys experience? What? How do you like working with each other as a family? Oh, uh, we hate it. <laughs> hey, it's, 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 we've known each other how total, long? Like total pain in the ass. <laughs> no. Well, we met when we were 18, if you can believe that. Um, actually met it at college at Arizona State. So we've been together a long time, uh, 34 years, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's actually, we really, really enjoy it. Um, Nicole really hasn't been, she's always been there um, throughout the entire process, but she didn't really come back to work full time with us until about four years ago. And, and she really has, has done an amazing job. And and you know, you know how it is. There's never a, a time clock. You're kind of talking about it all the time, whether we're sitting up in the jacuzzi at seven in the morning, trying to get our old bodies uh, working in the morning, or uh, we seem to be talking about it over dinner or whenever. So, you know, the, the industry is one of those industries that it's more of a lifestyle than necessarily a punch in, punch out type of deal. For sure. Bianca and I never stop talking about it. We're always on the phone with each other trying to coordinate everything too. So we totally get you there. Yeah, that's the truth. And you have what you originally called four bears, right? For your four kids. So I love that you guys were able to, um, you know, bring the company kind of along with them. Did you raise them along the vines and have they learned about everything hands-on as they've grown? Or is that something that you've kind of reserved for just the two of you? Yeah, you know, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I think the industry in general deals with kind of this idea of whether or not the next generation is going to have the same passion. Um, because it is a, you know, it's a hard business. It's an ag business and, and you definitely have to have a lot of love for it and, and it can't be forced on to you. So we kind of took this philosophy that we're going to expose the kids to it, but not feel like that it's being forced down their throat and and you know having four kids they all have a different personality to it and the reason we really 
kind of started with four bears is to really emphasize that, that it is a family entity, especially in, a, in an environment where we have a lot of corporate um, type of entities coming in and acquiring a lot of small mom and pop uh, wineries and family wineries. We, we continue to, to push the idea that we're still a family owned deal. And that's the reason their initials are on the back label of every bottle. Um, but along the way, uh, at least uh, our daughter just graduated, our second uh, number two child just graduated from uh, college and she's worked for another winery. She's working for a, a winery uh, this harvest. So I think she has intentions to come back and has a real interest in it, which is great to see. And, and I think our, our youngest probably is, is talking about going into wine and bit. So, you know, they've, they've been exposed to it, but not inundated with it. Let's say that. Right. For sure. And I saw that you get your grapes from California and from Oregon. So you kind of have your foot in two different places there. Uh, how do you think that flexibility really affects your offering? And um, do you ever expand on, or plan on expanding that portfolio to different viticultural zones around the country? You know, I think we're probably about as, as my bandwidth is uh, about as filled as it can be um, with with two two different areas, but um, two different states, I should say. We're pretty in a number of different areas in California, but. Um, uh, you know, the, the idea from the beginning was we we knew that we weren't going to, at least at this point, we don't own any vineyards. I've managed over 4,500 acres in my career. And with this project, it was really about hooking up with um, family growers. These are second, third generation farmers. And that's all they do is they, they grow wine grapes and they're very good at what they do. And it's our job not to screw it up once we, we pick it. So we have we're getting uh sourcing from the same place every single time every single vintage these are long-term sourcing contracts so we've developed an amazing relationships with with growers that are all sustainably farmed they're very great stewards of the earth and and grow just amazing grapes and and it starts there because i don't think our wines would be the way they are without the great great growers that we've been able to partner with but um but I think it also was the idea of going to where we thought the best grape for that particular varietal is grown and for us to really emphasize location and, and really express that through both the aroma and, and, and taste profile. And the first one I actually ever got to try from you was, and you might've seen this on social since you, you manage it. Um, but the first one I tried was the Point North Pinot, which I got from my local wine shop here in Ipswich. And we don't really carry that much. So I was really excited to try it. And it was my first introduction to you. Um, you were the first people we reached out to actually in the wine space. So I'm excited to finally have you on. I loved the, I loved the Pinot myself. Um, and I don't find a lot of Oregon wines at at least our local shop. So it was cool to see that there. Um, how did you decide on what to launch in the signature series? And is that the only one in the point North that you'll be doing or do you have others coming along? Um, yeah, that's probably the only thing that we're going to be doing um, it, uh, with under that label. Um, you know, Oregon's a very, very unique viticulture area, and, and we've I think we've both both Nicole and I love drinking Pinot and, and enjoy Pinot. It's probably one of the the key varieties we always seem to go to when we're thinking about. It. Usually, we're opening up a bottle of wine before we've decided what we're having for dinner, and that seems to be the most flexible. Uh, variety to work with but um, you know we make four different pinots and Oregon was just one of those things besides having the relationship up there and and enjoying the pinots from that area it just was another viticulture area that um, was really uh, really could see the the terroir as they say um, that really represents that the variety that we're uh, we're sourcing so and a little side note, you know, before we moved to California, we lived in Oregon. So we lived there for five years. Two of our four kids were born in Oregon, one in Portland and one in Eugene. And so when we looked at doing a Pinot project there, it just made sense because there's a soft spot in our hearts for the Oregon area and the people that we met up there. So it just worked in the whole profile. Yep. And from the other Oregon wineries that we've had a chance to talk to in that whole Northwest region, really, we've really seen a strong grasp of that culture and the people that are there love it and really like to stay connected to it. Um, I yeah, noticed sure. when going through your portfolio there, 
the California series, you have a four B at the end of the names. Does that connect back to four bears again? Is that like your original? That's, finches? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And that's how we, we named the winery after we always say all the proceeds were going to the kids anyway. So we named the winery <laughs> after them. So your parents can probably relate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but again, that's just to emphasize the, the family connection. And, and so we kept the, what we found was that more people seemed to uh, recognize Sean Miner over Four Bears. And, and so that just became more of the, the marquee, but uh, the connection there was still important. So that's the reason the Four B is still there. Nice. And uh, out of all the wines that you have, do you tend to have any top sellers? I know right now it looked like I saw that California Rosé was sold out for a while. Um, which ones tend to be your top sellers? Really, the the the, the Chard and the Pinot both are probably number one and two uh, in the four B tier. Um, and then, uh, similar to the Signature series, all of those do fairly the same. Uh, the Pinot might be leading that charge a bit more just because it's gotten so much press. Um, but uh, they all all of them seem to to uh, sell sell pretty well. But definitely, the Pinot and Chard are kind of what we're known for. Speaking of the Pinot and the Chardonnay, those are the two that we have here, the 2018. Um, before we get into trying those, out of pure personal curiosity, what are your favorite food and wine pairings when you're at home? Are there things that you reach for every time that you really, you know, are a staple at home? Well, you know, we're, we're California living, so the weather is usually pretty nice out here. Um, we're not heavy into meat and potatoes, even though Sean's from Kansas, which is probably how he grew up <laughs> eating a lot of meat and potatoes. So we're always thinking of sort of um, light fare, you know, uh, love ethnicity in our food. So I love to pair things with, well, the Pinot especially because it is very versatile. Um, our Sauvignon Blanc is very versatile. It's great during the summer months too when it's really hot here. Um, so I keep a blog of just some simple recipes, not a real, um, I love to cook. I'm Italian, uh, my background's Italian. And so um, I'm fairly creative in the kitchen. I'm not following a whole lot of recipes. A lot of it's just instinct and what I've learned from my grandmothers and my mom. But um, nonetheless, we try to keep things fairly simple and uh, very food friendly. So you can kind of drink any of our wines. I kind of open them up depending on the weather, really. And then I pick the food to go with it. <laughs> but Nicole does a great job on our blog. So you can check out, she has a number of recipes there. And, and uh, we try to keep that very, very active. And, and you know, it is, the industry is, uh, that's, that's the aspect. That's what we love so much about it. And it's kind of why we focus on creating wines that are so affordable and approachable, but still provide real varietal consistency and, and, uh, I think expectation uh, kind of exceeding the expectations in terms of price to quality. And, and for us, that, that, that lifestyle carries over into the kitchen and, and what you're eating with it. So they're very approachable, very food friendly style wines. Yeah. And your, your photos on your social pages are fantastic. Do you take them <laughs> yourself or do you have a photographer who is on staff doing little, that for a, you? A little, <laughs> a little bit of both. I think Nicole takes most of them. A out. little bit of both. All the, all the stories I'm doing myself, um, the, the photos that you're seeing on there, we actually schedule shoots and we do those with real intention in mind to kind of match up when we're releasing a particular, particular varietal. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big uh, combination and Sean loves photo shoot days. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are in a lot of the pictures, so <laughs> you must. Oh, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where can our listeners find the blog? Is that at your website or is it a separate link? The blog's on the website at the bottom of our homepage. So um, I'm due for writing a few things. We love to take trips and sort of do pairings with wine and where we're going and what sort of foods we're eating. So I'm due to load up a couple others, but that's pretty much where we put everything. What are, some, will... of your, what are some of your food favorites? <laughs> when you have to think of what you're gonna make during the week, what do you whip up? Oh gosh, you know what? I'll give you a perfect example. I love pesto. So last night, I, in fact, had no idea what I was going to make, and it was 5.45, and we have a ton of basil. It's going crazy right now with the weather. So I made some homemade pesto, and I did a little tortellini, and simple. Last night was just barbecue chicken, pesto, tortellini, some garlic bread, fresh salad. 
I love mushrooms. I love doing lots of different things with mushrooms. Um, uh, I think I do a lot of crostinis. That's on our blog. Um, I love that Italian influence. Honestly, if I could eat a charcuterie tray <laughs> and appetizers, I would be perfectly fine. Um, so those are some things. Yeah, we're fortunate in California. We have such such great, you know, everything's grown here, right? And yeah. and we have such fresh fresh vegetables. So we we do a lot of vegetables on the grill, and you know, it's especially it's summertime right now. It's so bloody hot. We even are experiencing some of the humidity that you guys get back there but um yesterday i think it, it got over 100 degrees with some with a thunderstorm that's pretty unusual for california but when it's when it's warm like that you just kind of eat lighter style and and as nicole said a lot of appetizer type stuff mm -hmm. a lot of fish yep yeah, we and make we're a lot of fish over here too yeah we're in <laughs> yeah. the northeast here right on the yeah. coast so we do a lot of fresh fish and everything I know I tend to, we both have Italian influence in our family, so we tend to stick to those types of foods too with our go-tos. I do a lot of piccatas and chicken marsalas and stuff, mm -hmm. so we tend to stick along those lines. Maine here mm -hmm. gets cold, so we got to go with some heavier, heartier pasta dishes a lot of the yeah. time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the, um, the Chardonnay that we have, which is very good, I just tried it for myself. How would you what would you describe are the primary tasting notes in the Chardonnay and what makes it different than other white wines that might be available in the market? Um, well, this is actually, uh, this is actually coming off a, a fairly uh, special vineyard in uh, Sonoma Cronero. So the most Southern part of the Sonoma Valley borders the San, San Pablo Bay. And, and you know, what, what's kind of unique about California is that it, it truly is a hot bit of culture area looking for cool sites. And, and, you know, unlike what we, we find in Oregon, which is a bit more of a cool bit, bit of culture area looking for warmer sites, uh, California really, when we're talking Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, we really have to have some type of coastal influence to help the growing uh, process on the vine be extended and pretty on the vine for the, for the grapes. So, um, this Chardonnay is coming out of one of those regions that has crazy levels of maritime fluent influence. So that San Pablo Bay is just below, uh, just above the San Francisco Bay. So we get all these cool breezes that work up their way through the waterways and the fog and everything that's developed just kind of sits on these vineyards. And, and the vineyards go from anywhere from almost sea level to about 13, 1400 feet above sea level. And, and that gives us these crazy diurnal shifts from day to night. So we'll have temperatures down into the high 40s all the way up into the 90s during the growing season. And that allows the fruit to mature very slowly on the vine. So we reach sugar levels and bricks levels very, uh, very slowly and methodically. And that creates a tremendous amount of, I think, concentration. Um, and in this Chardonnay particular, is is uh all hand harvested it's whole cluster pressed so we get it off the skins right away so we don't maintain any of the bitterness and uh from the skin contact and then from there it's racked over in the french oak and it's 100 percent barrel fermented um and we use uh um a very uh, lower levels of new oak so it's only about 15 to 20 percent new oak so i try not to inundate it one of the things that we take a lot of pride on being food friendly style wines is they're very, very balanced. So not one element standing above the other. So there's an integration of oak, just not just a massive, massive um, um, in your face level of oak. And so that helps integrate it a bit more. And, um, and then from there, about 60% of the barrels go through malactic fermentation. So we do soften the acids a bit, but we also leave about 40% unemmelled and that just gives us I think a little bit more texture in the mouth and richness so you get kind of the two balances out of California Chardonnay where that far right might be that big oaky buttery bomb the far left being that naked Chardonnay all stainless steel this kind of splits the middle and gives you some amazing texture in the mouth and it gives it a tremendous amount of length and that leaving some of that acidity in there allows the palate to be very very uh, cleansed when you're when you're having food with it so I think that's kind of the ideal scenario is that you're having a Chardonnay here that 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 provides some of that richness creaminess butterness but it also has some of those nice crisp green apple granny smith and almost a lemon curd 
uh, to it where it, it, it really kind of evolves in the mouth and then, and then finishes with some real, real nice length. Um, and in the Chardonnay, as I mentioned, we've gotten some nice accolades. This particular one, Spectator, uh, listed as one of the top 100 values of the year um, and listed 20 whites, and we were one of the whites that they pulled out. Nice. And um, I know you mentioned there that you don't use all new barrels. When you're sourcing your barrels, uh, is there any particular previous life of that barrel that you look for? I know a lot of like bourbon companies, you're only allowed to use the barrel once and then it gets shipped off. And a lot of, I know they ship over to Europe to do a lot of wines and stuff and sort of and more of a dark, like a robust red and stuff. What do you use and look for in your barrels when you're getting those? So these are going to be all of our barrels that we've used in previous vintages. So we typically have a 20% new oak program. So every year uh, we're moving about 20% new barrels into uh, the cellar. And, and then we'll use them typically to one to five years, um, sometimes a little bit longer if need be. The one thing about barrels is they're great holding vessels. And when you're at a winery and you're going through harvest and f finishing fermentation and looking where you put it, I mean, there's always, you're always scrambling trying to find places to put wine uh, as it's aging and, and barrels are one of those great vessels to use. So even if we get into a neutral barrel, where, which means that it's probably five years or older, we still will keep them around to just uh, allow it to hold the wine because there's other properties that it gets from it, whether it's uh, some, uh, oxidation, um, maybe it's not giving as much oak, but it's still providing some level of, of, of mouthfeel change um, that, that helps the final blend. So with the barrels for us, we're just rotating them through our program and then we sell them once we're done with them at the fifth to the seventh or eighth year. And so for anybody who hasn't tried your wines, you are available in over or in 49 states, is that correct? That's you're correct. in restaurants and in you're in shops. Correct. Are you only in restaurants in your area in California or are you kind of scattered across? No, we're, we're, we do uh, mostly uh, independent retail and then restaurants. And obviously right now, it's kind of turned on its ear with all the COVID stuff. So not a lot of restaurants are, are serving our wine. So you can find them retail. And we have a great we do an amazing job, I think, uh, to Nicole and the rest of the staff here that if you reach out for us, you provide a zip code or a city, we can find some place that, that carries our wines um, in your local area. Or you can check out our, our website. We do ship uh, to a number of different states. We're legal. So um, I think uh, we're licensed in every state to do that. So you can, you can check us out online as well. And you also have your Sean's Picks Wine Clubs. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? We're going to get into the red, and I know you have a reds only club. So, what is that all about? You can pull it up. You what? <laughs> I think I got to remember which ones are in that one. Well, they they rotate, so we rotate. sit down and look at that quarterly, and and uh, I kind of pick yeah. out kind of a, a smattering of of samples of of our wines, and and kind of try to pair them so they're a little bit different than than what you've had in the past. And we got um, Nicole's kind of layered in some great little programs. Um, that that you just make it easy. It's a real kind of turnkey. Shows up to your door, which is, is a kind of nice, nice feature with a little gift and a little uh, little info about about the wines and what the reason why I picked them. Yeah, we do that four times a year. Um, in fact, the next one's in October, <clears throat> and mostly the feedback is just people are so happy not to have to make a decision, and it shows up. And we always try to over deliver and put a little surprise in there. And um, it's, it's really a lot of loyalty comes from that, which is really nice. And then we do some fun little programs for club owners, like loyalty points and things like that, and just special gifts and special shipping and things like that. It's, it's a lot of fun. I always find the mystery boxes to be fun too, because you might get to try something that you wouldn't normally gravitate to. Absolutely. Very much so. And you can always bring wine to someone's house as a gift. So even if it's not your particular varietal that you are in love with, you know, um, the, they're all beautiful wines, so you certainly are always um, prepared. So the next one that we have is the 2018 Pinot Noir. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a great wine. Nick, I know you haven't gotten to try it yet, but I'll bring him to him tomorrow and he'll get to try them. Yeah, <laughs> she's going to drink them all before she gets there, just to let you know. That's why we're meeting bright and early. I'm making her wake up before work. 7 a.m. <laughs> um, That's great. 
<laughs> but the the wine is so smooth. I think it just has a great. It, it just feels great. It tastes great. It's just a really all around really good wine. Um, and I can say the same about your Oregon wine because I've had that as well. So we'd love to hear more about the tasting notes in this Pinot Noir. And I'd also be curious to hear what makes your Oregon and your California Pinots different? Well, that's a, a great, great question. I'll tell you, uh, I'll start with what makes them the same because they're really processed the same. Um, you know, we take a lot of pride in what we do with Pinot here, and, and we make four separate Pinots from four separate areas, and it's kind of fun to to line up all four of them and, and taste each of them um, and compare them, because they are definitely a real reflection of the area they're from. But from a similarity standpoint, um, everything's processed. We do a, what I describe as a gentle uh, crust to stem, and so... What we do is uh, typically with with red wine, you're, you're, uh, when you're going through crusher to stemmer, uh, it drops down into a must pump, and then you you force the crushed fruit through a nine inch hose into uh, the fermenter. Um, with our pinots, we jack up the crusher to stemmer and slide a four by four underneath. And what that does is uh, it's just much gentler on the fruit. Um, we kind of open the rollers as long as as wide as we can on the uh, crusher to stemmer. So in essence, you're almost just picking the stems off the berries. And when you look at photos, it, it really you see just almost these whole berries falling straight down into a four by four. And and any juice that you see is really from the weight of the fruit being on on top of each other and kind of. Um, pushing some of the juice out of the grapes. Uh, we typically will do some hand sorting before we even go to the crusher to stemmer. So we'll hoist the, um, uh, the bins uh, up and over um, into a hopper and then they run on a belt and we have people on either side going through and kind of looking at the fruit. Um, with Pinot Noir, we, we have susceptibility to humidity. Um, so we have, uh, typically we can have some um, botrytis um, anything like that that can affect the fruit that we try to remove right away. We remove any mog materials other than grapes. And then once we go through this gentle crust of stem, we hoist uh, the, the four by four up and over open top fermenter. So we're not forcing that through uh, any type of hose and it's called tote to tank. And, uh, and then these are glycol jacketed. So we drop the temperature down to about 57 degrees. Uh, one of the things that helps us out in terms of managing temperature is that we hand harvest everything at night here in California. So it comes into the cellar very, very cool. Oregon, we don't really, we go early morning, but typically it's it's much cooler up there. So we don't have to worry too much about the heat. But in California, it comes in uh, uh, in the middle of the night. So it's nice and cool. And then we drop this, the fermenter down to about 56, 57 degrees. And we just let the crushed fruit sit there. Uh, Pinot Noir is a very thin skin grape, so difficult to draw color and phenols and flavor compounds out of the skins. So this allows that time to occur that that kind of draws some of the juice and the skins uh, together. And that cold uh, soak just really, really allows that action to happen. And then once we start warming up the fermenters, fermentation begins. Uh, we manage the cap, which is the pumice and the grape skins that get pushed to the top. Uh, we kind of push that back down through a process called uh, punch down. We do that a couple times a day. So that kind of pushes all the skins and, and pumice back in with the juice. And then from there, once fermentation is done, we rack over in the French oak for about 10 months. And so really the only difference in both, both, both Point North as well as the Soma Coast Pinot is really done in the same way. Um, it's Both of them are 100% Pinot Noir. But really the true difference is, is just the viticulture area that, uh, you know, Oregon wine has a much cooler, cooler climate, less sun days than what we have in, in California. So tendency to have a little bit lower bricks or sugar levels. So tendency to be a little bit lighter in alcohol, but also a little bit lighter in terms of color. Um, but Oregon has this, this great acidity structure and great mouth appeal. Um, the, the California Pinot, uh, the Sonoma Coast, especially a little bit richer in the mouth, a little bit fuller bodied, uh, but has just great layers and, and some nice plum characters and some smokiness from the 10 months of oak aging. And uh, yeah, did I miss anything? <laughs> no, but I'm so ready to sit down and drink wine. <laughs> it's only it's only 2.30. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's uh, it's six over here, so we're at oh, one time. <laughs> we're beating you on that one, I think. <laughs> or Nick, he's just like, wait, wait, I don't have mine. <laughs> Drive it up here for me. <laughs> That's great. All right, so is there anything else that we didn't get to cover today that you guys wanted to end on, leave off on? No, I think you guys did a great job. Thank yeah. you very much. I think... Uh, uh, like I said, we uh, we have a pretty good distribution. So if you're you're looking to find our wines and you can't find it, uh, we can we can help steer you in the right way. So just uh, reach out for us. Check out our website. Nicole's very active on it. Follow us on Instagram. Please, yes, we love. I love. I respond to everything on Instagram. So I am the person all times of the day and night. <laughs> so at Sean Minor Wines, uh, yeah. both there and Facebook. So and yeah. Email hello at Sean Minor Wines, and we, we can help you out with anything. Yeah, and hopefully everyone stays healthy and happy and fights through this crazy time. All right. We had a great time talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time you. and sending the wines. Well, I'll definitely get the sample those <laughs> as soon as possible. Once again, from Bianca, I'm excited for it. Bianca's uh, really pumped them up for me a bit. So I love yeah. it. We'll end Thank on that. You both. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Appreciate it. Bye. See ya. Be sure to follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening.